Welcome to Greenwood Baptist Church. We are so glad you chose to be with us for worship online. If you're new to joining us, we'd like to personally welcome you back here next week or in person at one of our four services at 8.30, 9.45, 11, or 12.15. If you're interested in connecting with us, you can fill out a connection card online at greenwood.church connect. Now join us as we sing together in worship, followed by a sermon from Pastor Brian. Good morning, we're glad you joined us today. Let's sing together. Don't you gotta dance through the darkness, sing through the fire, praise when it don't make sense. Sometimes you gotta stand on the giant, worship from the lion's den. Sometimes you gotta shout it from the mountain, louder in the valley, trusting that he's gonna get you there. Sometimes you gotta welcome the wonder, wait for the answer, worship with your hands in the air. I'll praise you anywhere. Praise, give me praise, give me praise, the highest praise. Give me praise, give me praise, the highest
Except for a heart singing Alleluia, Alleluia. And you are worthy of it all. You are worthy of it all. from you are all things and to you are all things you deserve the glory let's just sing that out together
Chains, I'm a prisoner no more. My shame was a ransom, and faithfully. Darkness rejoiced as though heaven had lost. But then Jesus arose with thy freedom in him. Yeah. That's when death was arrested, my life began. Oh, your grace so free washes over. Thank you. 
how's everybody doing today? Well, today we're uh, continuing our series on uh, dark horses, and those are uh, kind of unexpected people that God uses to do great things. And so, if you want to turn your Bibles to Judges chapter 6, um, we're going to um, begin there in just a moment. And, you know, last week we talked about uh, Jacob, who became Israel, and this week we're going to talk about a guy named Gideon, and we're going to start out and kind of uh, look at the first uh, verses 3 through 10 that give us kind of the background about the situation that uh, Israel was in when Gideon is uh, raised up by God to be um, a, a mighty warrior, and uh, if you don't mind, please stand in honor of the reading of God's Word, Judges chapter 6, beginning in verse 3. <clears throat> Whenever the Israelites planted their crops, marauders from Midian, Amalek, and the people of the east would attack Israel, camping in the land and destroying crops as far away as Gaza, which, by the way, was part of Israel, just saying. They left the Israelites with nothing to eat, taking all the sheep, goats, cattle, and donkeys. These enemy hordes, coming with their livestock and tents, were as thick as locusts. They arrived on droves of camels, too numerous to count and they stayed until the land was stripped bare. So Israel was reduced to starvation by the Midianites. Then the Israelites cried out to the Lord for help. When they cried out to the Lord because of Midian, the Lord sent a prophet to the Israelites. He said, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I brought you up out of slavery in Egypt. I rescued you from the Egyptians and from all who oppressed you. I drove out your enemies and gave you their land. I told you... I am the Lord your God. You must not worship the gods of the Amorites in whose land you now live, but you have not listened to me. Thank you. You may be seated. First, I want, first thing I want to do is welcome all those who are joining us online for this service. Appreciate you being here. And uh, a shout out to my mom in Arkansas. Hey, mom. Just, just uh, yeah, okay. Give me the awe. <laughs> um. Israel's not in a great place, and um, the Midianites come, and, and they, what they do is, an Israelite, the Israelites are, are either just don't have the courage to fight back, don't have the people, the numbers, all those things, and the main thing is they don't have the relationship with God is not right to be able to call on him, and yet they do. They call on him and say, God, help us, and God tells them the reason you're in this spot is because you you turn your back on me to worship other gods. And so the Midianites will come in and other nations, and they, they come in, it's like a big fair, a big camp for them. They wait until uh, the Israelites have, have harvested all their, their food for the year, and then they come in and just take what they want. And they, they you know, uh, the Israelites don't do anything to stop them. And, and thus, they reduce the Israelites every year to uh, near starvation because they don't have anything to get through the winter. They don't have anything to get to the next harvest time. And in the midst of that, the Bible says that um, a, an angel comes. And in Judges chapter 6, verses 11 through 16, then the angel of the Lord came and sat beneath the great tree of Ophrah, which belonged to Joash of the clan of Abiezer. Gideon, son of Joash, was threshing wheat at the bottom of a wine press to hide the grain from the Midianites. The angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, Mighty hero, the Lord is with you. Now I want you to kind of get a picture of this. First of all, I want you to understand what a, what a wine press was. It says it the, in the bottom of the wine press. And it, at those times, it would probably have been most likely would have been something that would have been carved out of rock. And it would have been usually on a slope or something because there would have been uh, something at the top, and that's where the grapes were. There'd be a, a, a big bowl shape in the uh, cut into the rock, and that's where they would press the grapes. Now I don't know if they did it with you know women with bare feet wearing little singing Italian songs. I don't know how they did it, but they would press the grapes. Okay, and then the 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 grape juice would run down into the bottom. There'd be a huge vat, and it's in this vat where they're threshing wheat. And you know what? To us, we're like, okay, cool. They're threshing wheat. But threshing wheat was a dirty job. Um, what they would do was they would throw up the wheat, and, and, and the chaff and the dust would be separated by the wind 
from the good wheat, from the, from the actual wheat, and it would fall back to the ground, whereas the chaff and the dust would just be blown wherever, which way. And can you imagine how dirty he was? Um, you know, when I was a young man, uh, a guy who, who uh, had land near where I live came and asked me one day, hey, you want to you wanna put up hay? And um, I said, sure. And he said, uh, well, I'll pay you by the bale. And I'm thinking, oh, man, little did I know. <laughs> that wasn't going to be a whole lot of bale. But anyway, um, I went and did it. We put up like 1,000 bales over several days. And we would, we would go to these different places. And, you know, what I would do back then was you'd walk along the trailer. They'd pull it along. And in Tennessee, everything's like this. So you'd go up the hill. And you throw bales up on there, and then you once you got it full, strap it down, you take it off to a barn. And because I was the low man on the totem pole, I had to go in the barn and stack the hay when it came in. And when I was done, even just, just this is just hay, I would be covered head to toe with dirt, dust, hay. And you would just, I'd just go out and, and you basically just hose yourself off. I mean, it would coat your hair. As you'd sweat, it'd become like a paste. I mean, I'm, it, it's really grody. Am I? Am I being descriptive enough yet? So anyway, you can imagine that's exactly what Gideon looked like. And so dude didn't, you know, they, they didn't wait to show up after he'd had a shower and dinner and, and, and you know, put on a little after shave. I mean, he's, he's at his worst moment. And he's dirty and dusty because he's having to thresh this wheat somewhere where there's no real ventilation so that the Midianites won't come and take all his food. So he's hiding out, threshing down there, getting dirtier and dirtier. And then the angel of the Lord appears, appears and says, Mighty hero, the Lord is with you. Sir, Gideon replied, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? And where are all the miracles our ancestors told us about? Didn't they say the Lord brought us, out of, brought us up out of Egypt? But the Lord has abandoned us and handed us over to the Midianites. Then the Lord turned to him and said, Go with the strength you have and rescue Israel from the Midianites. I am sending you. Now, Gideon was just like a lot of us. God sometimes shows, shows up when we feel less, the least prepared for something. I mean, Gideon is supposed to go lead the, and rescue Israel. I feel sure he didn't feel much like a rescuer. As a matter of fact, he even answers, but Lord, how can I rescue Israel? My clan is the weakest in the whole tribe of Manasseh. Now, Manasseh is one of the, the it's a half tribe, okay? When Joseph went to Egypt, he had two sons, and when they came out, those two sons became the heads of half tribes. So together, Manasseh and Ephraim were one tribe. So he's from a half tribe. Okay, and not only that, the, the half-tribe of Manasseh, they were kind of a little standoffish from everybody else because when they got up to the promised land, they're about to cross over at the Jordan. The tribe of Manasseh said, ah, we're going to stay right here. We like this land. They didn't even go into the promised land. And so all the rest of Israel went out to fight them, and they said, hold on, we'll help you go in and conquer it, but we just want to come back. And so they said, well, okay. So they're kind of off on their own anyway. And so he says, look, I, I'm from... My clan is the weakest, and you get the idea, he's not like over-exaggerating here. It sounds like truth, doesn't it? My, hey, I'm from a half-tribe, and then my family, my clan, where, where my line from, we like the weakest of all them. So we're the weakest clan in a half-tribe, and then he says, and I am the least in my entire family. So in other words, Gideon was never the one that people said, y'all watch Gideon. He finna do something. He gonna be something. Uh-uh. Gideon would have been the one when he said, I got an idea. Shut up, Gideon. Go over in the corner. What do you know? You ain't done nothing. Look at you. Dirty out there. Just go on. He was the least in his family. Probably the last born. No expectations of him. Hasn't done anything. He's done nothing except go off and hide in a little vat to hide his grain. Getting all dirty. That's all he's done. The Lord said, I will be with you. 
and you will destroy the Midianites as if you are fighting against one man. You know, one of the things I love about this passage is how God doesn't see us the way we see ourselves. You know, when he comes up to Gideon, Gideon doesn't see himself as a mighty hero. He doesn't see himself as someone that can deliver the Israelites from, from their oppressors. But God sees him that way. And God addresses him that way. And you know what, as believers, that is one of the hardest things to do, isn't it? It's when you read the scripture and you see how God sees us. It is really hard to see ourselves that same way. When the Bible says that we are declared righteous, I don't know about you, but I don't really wake up in the morning going, hey, I'm righteous. I mean, not like 1970s, you know, when they say, oh, man, you're righteous. I mean, like biblical righteous. I don't, I don't look in the mirror and think, man, that is one righteous man. I don't see myself that way. I see myself as a flawed sinner that's saved by grace. And those things are true. But when God looks at us, he sees who we are with him, not who we are alone. And that's what he's seeing with Gideon. Gideon didn't have in his own strength the power to go out and defeat the Midianites. But with what God could do in and through him, he had more than enough. And so we have to have a balance between when we look at the scripture of recognizing this is what God says about us. We've been declared righteous. We are his children. We are co-heirs along with Christ to everything that is going to come. And recognize that we have the ability to enter the throne room of God with confidence asking for help in times of need. And Gideon begins this journey. You know, one of the things that God does is he calls and he says, look, this is, this is the name. This is what I'm calling you. And one of my favorite scriptures is in Revelation 2.17. It says, anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. To everyone who is victorious, I will give some of the manna that has been hidden away in heaven, and I will give to each one a white stone, and on the stone will be engraved a new name that no one understands except the one who receives it. You know, someday God's going to hand me a stone, and God's going to hand you a stone, and there's going to be a new name on there. And it's all going to make sense. You're going to recognize and, and understand how God sees you and what your name, because names are very significant in the scripture. And there are a lot of different interpretations about what that means. My belief is, I believe that it is going to be a name that is going to be what we really are and what God created us to be. But I can't imagine being given a name by God that no one will understand except us. And God has a name for you now. A name that talks about what you're, what you're going to be, what you can be in your journey of faith. And so what does he do with Gideon? He starts the journey. You know, the big problem he sent it to all of them was that they were worshiping other gods. And so that night, in Judges 6, 25 through 27, the Lord said to Gideon, take the second bull from your father's herd, the one that is seven years old. Pull down your father's altar to Baal and cut down the Asherah pole standing beside it. Then build an altar to the Lord your God here on this hilltop sanctuary, laying the stones carefully. Sacrifice the bull as a burnt offering on the altar, using as fuel the wood of the Asherah pole you cut down. So Gideon took 10 of his servants and did as the Lord commanded. So God gave him a task, and it had to do with eliminating those things that were false worship. And he, one of the things I find kind of fascinating, he didn't say, hey, go out to the town and find one of them. He said, go to your father's altar, the one that your, father, that your dad put up. Tear it down. Make an altar. And so Gideon did as the Lord commanded, but he did it at night because he was afraid of the other members of his father's household and the people of the town. 
And you know, you could look at that and think, well, man, he's still walking in fear. But I look at that and think, but he took a step. He obeyed. Yeah, he was still fearful. Yeah, he wasn't that mighty hero yet. I mean, a hero would have just strolled in there in the middle of the day and, and pounded his fist somewhere and said, hey, all you people, I'm fitting to knock this down right here. And I'm going to offer a sacrifice to the one true God. That's what a hero would have done. And Gideon's not that yet, but he's being obedient. And he, he knocks down the altar to Baal, and he cuts down the Asherah pole, and he does the sacrifice. Now, he does it in secret so nobody else can see it, but he took a step. He did what he was told. And that's the way God operates, is, you know what, there's a... There's something God wants you to do, and there's always going to be a first step. There's always going to be something that God's going to tell you. You know, when, when my wife and I were struggling to have children and we were going through all the different tests and everything, and, and it, you know, I, I've told people, as a youth minister, I spent 20 years telling teenagers, hey, it only takes one time. And then I'd spent years now as an adult going, this seems like it's impossible to actually conceive a child. And so it, it, it was hard. And we started doubting, and we didn't know what was going on. And we were like, well, maybe we're not supposed to. But we did believe that God had said we were going to have a family. And so I really believed that God was telling me, you need to take a step. And so I did something, and it wasn't, it wasn't this huge thing. I didn't hire a plane you know, to go fly a banner to them, that, hey, they're going to, you know, bonds are going to have a family. When we, I didn't do any of that. I went down to the, uh, to the toy store, and I bought a little Nerf football. And I, because I, I felt like our first child was going to be a son, and he was. And I just took it, and I put it in the room that was going to be the nursery. And we started working on preparing that room to be a nursery as a, as a step of faith before God. And look, it didn't set anybody, <laughs> it didn't set the world on fire that I went down and bought a Nerf football. You understand what I'm saying? But I took a step. Because it, 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 was, it was a commitment. And we told people that we had done it. It was moving forward. It, it's going to happen. We believe it. And Gideon took that step. And he knocked down the false gods. And he did what God told him to do. And yeah, he did it at night and nobody was around, but he did what he was told to do. Then in Judges 6, 33 through 35, soon afterward, the armies of Midian, Amalek, and the people of the east formed an alliance against Israel and crossed the Jordan, camping in the valley of Jezreel. Then the spirit of the Lord clothed Gideon with power. He blew, you know, sometimes when you take that step and and it, it, you feel it, it, it is power comes on you. And Gideon was feeling that. He blew a ram's horn as a call to arms, and the men of the clan of Abiezer came to him. He also sent messengers throughout Manasseh, Asher, Zebulun, and Naphtali, summoning their warriors, and all of them responded. 32,000 men showed up to fight the Midianite. As a matter of fact, the people in the town they came out, and they were mad that he cut down the, they knocked down the altar of Baal and cut down the Asherah poles. So they went to his dad and said, once they figured out who it was, said, send him out that we may kill him. And he said, what are you talking about? If Baal's really a god, let him kill whoever he wants to. And so from that time, time on, they started calling him Jerob Baal, which means the one who knocked down the altar of Baal. He got a new name out of it right then from the people. It's pretty good. And so now... He's feeling it. Maybe I, maybe I can do this. And he sends out this, these messengers, and, and an army shows up. And I don't know about you, but I'm probably like, man, that's 32,000 men. Now, there's like a couple hundred thousand over there, but that's still pretty good. And then he has, and a lot of us do, he had a moment kind of of crisis. And in chapter 6, verse 36 through 40, then Gideon said to God, if you're truly going to use me, to rescue Israel as you, as you promised. Prove it to me in this way. 
I will put a wool fleece on the threshing floor tonight. If the fleece is wet with dew in the morning, but the ground is dry, then I will know that you're going to help me rescue Israel as you promised. And that is just what happened. Now, here's the thing. <clears throat> the Bible says thou shalt not put the Lord your God to the test. I get that. But there are times when we're praying and we're trying to move forward in faith and we're just asking God, God, I, what we're really saying is I need some reassurance. I need to know. You see, Gideon, he's taken a step, and now, now he's really out there. Now he's committed because now he's raised an army. And so now, he, now he's, he's out there. He's hanging in the wind. And he's saying, God, if, if I just need to know. And you know, one of the things that gets me is God doesn't rebuke him for asking for a silly test. God doesn't rebuke him for saying, Lord, I, I just, just show me. And the funny thing is, you know, you put a fleece out, and he said, I want the ground around it to be dry and the fleece to be wet. But any of us who've ever gone outside late in the morning would know that if we left something out there that holds water, it'll a lot of times have be wet from the dew even as the ground is dry because that's how the whole evaporation thing works. And so at some point he, he did that and he went, oh. And so he comes back and he says, uh, um, please don't be angry with me. But can I make, let me make one more request. Let me use the fleece for one more test. This time, let the fleece remain dry while the ground around it is wet with dew. Because now that would be something. And God didn't say, dude, I've answered your question. That's it. So that night, God did as Gideon asked. You know, what, what I, I think we get from that, I, I don't, I'm not saying you go out tomorrow or the next day or whatever and start laying down fleeces out in the, out in the grass. But what, what I think you can get from that is God wants you to know his will. And here's the deal, that, that sometimes when we're young in our faith and when we're just beginning and, and we're in that journey, we can ask some questions. Now, there's going to come a point down the road where you won't need to ask those anymore. But God is merciful, and he's good, and he wants you to know. And so he did both things, just like he asked. So now he's sitting there. He's got 32,000 men, feeling pretty good about things. God's answered both of his requests. He's, he's called out to men. He's got 32,000. And so he's feeling pretty good. His faith is strong. He's like, I got, I mean, there's a whole lot of men there with him. He's like, maybe I can do something with this. And then God says something kind of, kind of different to him. So Jeroboam, that is Gideon, and his army got up early and went as far as the spring of Herod. The armies of Midian were camped north of them in the valley near the hill of Morah. The Lord said to Gideon, you have too many warriors with you. Now they're still outnumbered like two or three to one. And God comes to him and says, you got too many. If I let you fight the Midianites, the Israelites will boast to me that they saved themselves by their own strength. Therefore, tell the people, whoever's timid or afraid may leave this mountain and go home. So 22,000 of them went home, leaving only 10,000 who were willing to fight. Now, here's what God does. God's going to build your faith. He's going to ask you to do something. He's going to ask you to take a step of faith. Do you know where believers sometimes get hung up? Is, is we, they see the big picture, and they want to skip all the steps in between. They want to just go straight to it. And God's saying, you need to deal with this first. What did Gideon have to deal with first? He had to deal with the false worship. It, it was part of his family. It was part of him. He had to get rid of everything that was between him and God because that's how God's power works. And so where, where believers get hung up sometimes is that, that little step God asks them to make because we don't think it's all that important or we're worried what everybody else is going to say. And so we don't take the first little step. But you don't skip steps. 
God just keeps putting it out there. It may be in a little different way, but he's going to keep putting that step out there until you take it. So now he's taking it. He's built his faith. He's given him some strength. And now what does he do? Same thing he'll do to all of us. He's going to strip it away. He's going to strip away our strength. Why, now, why would God do that? Why would God let, let Gideon pull in 32,000 people and then strip it away? Because God wants a no-doubter. How many of y'all like, anybody in here like baseball? I mean, I'm sure some of you do. You know, there's different kinds of home runs. There's home runs where the, where the announcer's like, well, it's a long fly ball, and you see the outfielders, and man, they're running, they're heading back to where the ball is, and, and you're not sure if it's going to hit on the warning track or, on the, or, or go over, and you're, you know, everybody's like, what's going to happen? And, it, and it, you know, the guy jumps up, and he makes an off, and it just goes barely past his glove. That still counts as a home run. But then there's some like, man, some of the ones Adolis Garcia hits. Y'all watch some of those? When it comes off the bat, you hear this, it's a different kind of crack. And they show the outfielders, and they don't even move. They're like, I ain't wasting my time. The pitcher goes, you know, he, you see their dugout. They know it immediately. It is a no-doubter. It's like in the third deck, hitting some poor kid up there who's just trying to eat a hot dog. And here comes the ball right there. I mean, that's what they call a no-doubter. The moment it comes off the bat, nobody in the building had a doubt. And see, that, that's the kind of victory that God wants to give you. It is a no-doubter. But for it to be a no-doubter, it's got to be no doubt who did it. You understand? You ever prayed for something, and, and you know, you're praying about it, and then you do something, and, and, and at the end, you're not really, you're like, well, did, did God do that, or did I do it? I mean, was that a coincidence or did God do something? I've had some of those. But I've also had times where I've asked God to do something and I had no ability to make it happen. And the only hope for it was if God showed up and did something that we couldn't do ourselves. You know, one of the things that, that our, our church and our staff has been committed to through the years is doing things that would only work if God showed up. And those, are, those can be kind of scary, but those are the best. Those are the best victories. And in my personal life, those are the victories that changed my life. It's not the ones where, well, you know, I was working on, you know, I was praying and, 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 and something happened and, and I, you know, I just... Thank you, God, but I just, I, in the back of my mind, I'm like, well, what really happened there? But those, those victories where I'm at that spot and I have nothing, where I'm crying out going, God, if you don't do this, it's not going to happen. Those are the victories that change your life. And so, God gets him down to 10,000. And then he goes to Gideon again and said, you've got too many people. And he says, I want you to take them down to the river. And I want you to make two groups, the ones that, that lean all the way down and drink from the river with their mouth to get a drink, and those that get on a knee or whatever and, and reach down and get in their hand and lap it like a dog. Now, I've even heard people preach a sermon on how they re, how they drank the water, and I, I do I do not believe there is spiritual significance in lapping water like a dog. Okay, I really believe the significance was God stripping them down. Only three of them, three hundred of them, did it like that. And God said, "That's your group." So he's gone from thirty two thousand to three hundred. Now, 32,000, we've heard of victories throughout. You know, I, I mean, we've heard of, of, of victories against great odds where through great generalship and, and, and personal courage, outmaneuvering, doing something surprising. 
The small armies have been able to beat big armies throughout history. But here's the deal. 300 against a few hundred thousand. Mm. And so now he's got him to where this is it. And see, here's why it's so important is because God's strength is perfected in our weakness. Now, that's not just something I said. That's scripture. 2 Corinthians 12, 8 through 10. Three different times I begged the Lord to take it away. Paul's talking about a thorn in his flesh. Each time he said, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. You see, we want to do it the opposite way, don't we? We want to get stronger. We think, well, if I could learn this, if I could do this. You know, every great action movie montage has, has a, a scene where, you know, the, the, the guy's fixing to go into battle and he's way, you know, he's, it's, it's against all the odds and so he goes off. And in a few scenes, you know, he's lifting weights or he's fighting or he's, learning, he's becoming an expert of weapons. And then he goes and he fights. And, and we all want to think, man, I want to go get stronger. I want to go do this. You know, I can remember when God called me in, in the ministry and when he called me to be a pastor, it took years for me to get used to people calling me pastor. I mean, I had some, I mean, you know, there were some things I thought that would be good. I speak five languages. I don't know if y'all know that. I speak English, although my wife would disagree sometimes. I speak deep Southern. I, and after 22 years, I've gotten passable at speaking Parker County. And I speak smart aleck and sarcasm. Some people think that's the same language, but it's really not. There's subtle differences that if you know it, you'll know. So, you know, I had that going for me. <laughs> but here's the deal. I, I'm like, I, I, I don't, what do I need to get? I need to get something to be able to do that. You need to follow and do what God calls you to do. Now, God may give you a step or two that will help equip you. But for the most part, what you need is just to be faithful and let God do what God can do. He says, look. My power works best in weakness. So now I'm glad to boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ can work through me. That's why I take pleasure in my weaknesses and in, in, in the insults, hardships, persecutions, and troubles that I suffer for Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. You see, God doesn't, he's not trying to make you weak. He's trying to strip away your strength so that he can be strong in you so that you recognize this is not by my power. But when you have his power, you have more than enough strength to do whatever God puts in front of you. You have all the strength you need. When I am weak, then I am strong. Because here's the, the tendency we all have. One of the first things kids say, I can do it myself. As soon as they're talking, I mean, I can remember hearing it out of all of my kids. You know, first when they're a little scared, I'm like, can you help me? And then they're like, I'd do it myself. And they're like, no, you can't. You're not ready to do that. But they want to, They think they can, and so that's where we are with God sometimes. I'll do it myself. When we think we have the strength to do it, we would rather do it in our own strength. But God says, listen, your strength ain't enough, and you need to recognize it. You need to realize it. And so here's what happens. He gets down to the 300, and he says, look, we're going to go down there. This is the plan. We're going we're gonna to take light torches, and we're going to put a clay pot over the torch so nobody can see it. And then you're also going to carry a ram's horn, and you get, you, we're going to put you in position all around them. And I'm going to break mine, and when you hear, hear it break and you see the light and you hear the ram's horn, everybody does it at the same time. Break the lamp. Break the, the, the clay pot so the, the light can shine and blow this horn. And so they all got in position around the camp. And it says in Judges 7, 21 through 22, each man stood in his position around the camp and watched as all the Midianites rushed around in a panic, shouting as they ran to escape. When the 300 Israelites blew their ram's horns, the Lord caused the warriors in the camp to fight against each other with their swords. Those who were not killed fled to 
fled to places as far away as Beth Shittah near Zerera and to the border of Abel. I don't even know how to pronounce that. I'm not going to lie. A.M. near Tabith. You see, God caused such confusion. They, they, they defeated themselves. Did you catch that first part? Each man stood at his position around the camp and watched. Gideon's men at this initial battle, they just went, wow, look at that. They didn't fight. They didn't do anything. Now, afterwards, they gathered up their men. They went after them. Here's, here's the thing you got to understand. We tend to view what we're going through. Do you know how Paul could say, that's how I, I rejoice in insults and persecutions and difficulties? That's why it says in James, rejoice when you encounter trials. I get it. Trials are not fun. Nobody likes them. But it's because God has the long view in mind. God is more concerned about who you become through the trial than he is about the trial. The trial to him is nothing. It's an exercise, an opportunity for us to grow in our faith. And here's the deal. Some of the trials that I thought could kill me or destroy me or wipe me out or end whatever God wanted to do with me early in life that I trusted him in, that he won, prepared me for what was coming. And so there were trials that came later that were big trials. And you know what? I was able to go, eh. I ain't worried about that. I know what God can do. And it still wasn't fun, but it was preparation. Every little trial in front of you, every little step God gives you is part of a long victory, a no-doubter victory that God wants to give you. See, you see how it turns out later on in Judges 8, 22 through 23, then the Israelites said to Gideon, be our ruler. You and your son and your grandson will be our rulers, for you have rescued us from Midian. And if, if Gideon had taken that 32,001, he might have said, yeah, I'll do it. But because he knew who, get, who brought the victory, he knew where it came from. Gideon replied, I will not rule over you, nor will my son. The Lord will rule over you. He said, I'm not going to be a king. God's your king. And then in Judges 28, this is the story of how the people of Israel defeated Midian, which never recovered. The Midianites were never any threat again. Throughout the rest of Gideon's lifetime, about 40 years, there was peace in the land. And there was peace not because Gideon won a battle, but because God was determined to do something in Gideon, the least likely person, so that God's people could have peace. So whatever it is you're facing, recognize it, it, it's not, I'm not saying it's fun, but realize that God has something greater in store. And be faithful in the steps that God puts in front of you, no matter how small or insignificant you think they may be or whether or not they matter or not. Be faithful in the small steps. And when the big victories come, there'll be no doubter victories. And when no doubter victories come into your life, it will change you. It will change you. That's why you can ask people, believers, and go back and say, man, how did you get through that? Sometimes things that are, that are so unbelievably difficult, we don't even want to talk about them, and yet you see God bring people through it. And you might even ask them, would, if you could go back and do it again, would you avoid that? And they will tell you to an, I guarantee you. I don't want to go back and go through it again, but I wouldn't change a thing. Because what God did in me through that victory changed me forever. Those battles, as hard as it is to recognize when you're in the middle of one, because, man, the, 
our, our tendency is to just want to get away from it. But those battles are for your benefit. And God wants to do something in you through that battle that will last a life, lifetime. So even if you don't understand, ask God. God, show me. What is it you want me to do? Because you got to know what he wants you to do. That's important. And then you can't skip steps. You do the next thing. You do whatever's right in front of you. And you be faithful to it. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes, please? You know, whether you're here in this room or, or you're watching online, my question to you is, do you have a relationship with Christ? That's what it started out with with Gideon. The first thing he had to do <coughs> was commit to removing the things in his life that were keeping him from following God. And for those of you, if you don't have a relationship with Christ, that's your first step. <coughs> and what's keeping you from being able to approach God is, is your sin. And that's part of that, what it takes for us to, to know him. The Bible tells us, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And so you've got to admit that you're a sinner and ask forgiveness. That's got to be removed. And that's removed because of Jesus. And you've got to believe that Jesus is God's son. That he died on the cross so that you might be forgiven of your sins. And that he rose from the grave to prove that he is who he says he is. And also to bring us life. And then the third thing is you got to confess Jesus as Lord. It says in Romans 10, 9, and 10, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And so if you'd like to know today that your sins are forgiven, that you're in right relationship with God, if you'd like to know that you'll be with him forever, then I want to encourage you to pray this simple prayer of salvation. You can just pray in your heart. God will hear you. But if that's you, I want you to pray it with me right now. And you, if you want to, pray it with me right now. Dear God, thank you for loving me and thank you for Jesus. God, I know I'm a sinner. Forgive me of my sins. Come into my heart, my life. Cleanse me. I believe Jesus is your son. I believe he died on the cross for my sins. And I believe he rose on the third day. So today, I trust Jesus as my Savior and confess him as my Lord. Now, without anybody looking around for just a moment, I'm going to ask anyone that prayed that prayer today, if you meant it, all I'm going to ask you to do, I'm not going to ask you to stand up. I'm not going to call you out. But I want you to look up at me. If you prayed that prayer, I want you to look up at me right now. I want to pray for you and I want to encourage you. Okay, I'll see you. All right. Okay. All right. I see you. Thank you. Now, I want to encourage you, if you're here with your parents, I want you to tell your parents right after the service, that you get a chance, that you prayed that prayer with Pastor Brian. And parents, I'd encourage you to call up here and talk to one of our children's ministers. They would love to sit down with you and your child and, and go through it and make sure they understand the decision they're making, answer any questions either one of you might have, and then talk to you about the next steps in following Christ. For adults, there's a teenagers there's a number on the screen you can text there's a qr code there which is also in your bulletin and you can let us know by either one of those and what we'll do is get in touch with you and set up a time to meet whether it's on the phone or in person answer any questions and talk to you about the next steps and you're welcome to come to church here 
But if you feel led to go somewhere else, we're, that's okay. We'll love you and help you any way we can. And we'd love to have the opportunity to just encourage you and pray with you. So right now, I want to pray for you. And I want to tell you that, that as of that moment, when you prayed that prayer in faith, the scripture tells us that in that moment, that if you confess the Lord Jesus, you will be saved. And so it is a done deal. Not because of what you did, but because of what Jesus did for you. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for your grace, for your mercy. I thank you for these that have come to a new knowledge in faith in Christ. I pray that you will continue to lead them, that you'll teach them, that, Father, you'll send other believers into their life to encourage them, and, Father, you'll help them to find the right church home where they can learn and, and be discipled. And, Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for those that are here. And, Lord, we pray blessings upon them. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Our annual Greenwood Student Ministry Golf Tournament will be May 4th at Holiday Hills Golf Course in Mineral Wells. The money raised from the tournament will be used to help students participate in mission trips, camps, and retreats. You can register your team at greenwood.church slash events or by filling out a brochure. If you're not a golfer, you or your business could still help sponsoring a hole in the tournament. For more info, contact our next gen pastor, John Hartman, or grab a brochure from the information desk in the foyer. We want to invite all families in our next gen ministries to a night of fun, food, and fellowship. Our next gen family night, Family Feud Style will be Friday, April the 26th from 6 to 8 p.m. here at the church. We will be serving a meal and playing Family Feud. Families that dress up in themed costumes of their choosing will get an extra chance to be on stage to play Family Feud and win fun prizes. This will be a night you won't want to miss. Get registered today by going to greenwood.church slash events. For more info or questions, contact anyone on our Next Gen team. Greenwood will be sending a mission team to Longmont, Colorado to serve through community engagement and block parties, and we would love to have you join us. For more information, we'll have a mission trip interest meeting on Wednesday, April 24th at 6 p.m. You can sign up online at greenwood.church slash events or at the table in the foyer. We are so glad you were able to join us this week. You can give your tithes and offerings online at greenwood.church slash give or by dropping them in one of the black boxes marked offering located in the back of the worship center and in the foyers. Now, here's one of our pastors. This is my friend Lila, and Lila went through a kids' faith class with our, pre or our children's minister, Stephanie. And Lila, have you come to that place where you've asked Jesus to come into your heart and be your Lord and Savior? Yes, sir. Are you going to serve him all of your life? Yes, sir. If you're a friend or family member of Lila's, would you stand in honor of her baptism? Lila, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried with Christ and raised to walk in new life. All right. We want to thank each and every one of you for finding time to come worship with us today. If you made a decision to follow Jesus or are interested in connecting with us, we encourage you to visit greenwood.church slash connect. We hope to see you back here next Sunday or in person at 830, 945, 11, or 1215. Be blessed.